Okay, welcome everyone to um, Bridges of Belonging. This is number 17. The weeks just keep flying by. Um, so really excited about today's conversation and so thrilled to have some incredible guests here joining us again. I always feel so grateful to the guests that say yes through each session. Um, I do want to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people here in Victoria and I'm home to the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasonic Nations. And um, I've been so grateful to be safe and welcomed here as a guest, particularly during COVID times. My name's Andrea Carey. My pronouns are she, her and hers, particularly important today on International Pronouns Day to uh, recognize those. And um, I'm the Chief Inclusion Officer with Inclusion Incorporated. So welcome to Bridges of Belonging if this is your first one. And if you're uh, a regular here, then uh, welcome back. So we do ask that people just stay muted and keep your cameras off um, for the session, but you're welcome to ask questions in the chat box and we'll get to addressing those um, as we get through with the first few questions of the session today. So I always begin um, with a reading. And so today's reading is from Richard Wagamese, One Drum. And um, for those of you that have been here before, you know that Richard Wagamese is one of my favorite authors. So I often share from his books. Um, so today I'm going to do a short reading and then I'll introduce um, Richard and Riza. So here we go. Um, many have forgotten their beginnings, but next time you are out with people and it's a summer night and a camp campfire is lit, watch how everyone responds to it. As night falls and the flames climb higher, people, regardless of their cultural background, will lean in toward the flame. Some will cup their chin in their hands. Others will lean forward with their elbows on their knees. Still others might lean back in their chair and idle there, never taking their eyes off the fire. A pervasive quiet descends and soon there is only the crackle of the fire, the snap of the logs. Everyone breathes more deeply, everyone relaxes. This scenario happens everywhere around the world when people gather in a circle around the fire in the night. I believe it's because we all carry a specific cellular memory based on the feeling, spiritual feeling of togetherness, safety and belonging. It is the basis of our human identity, community, and it formed in all of us a long, long time ago. There is a particular magic that exists when the world is reduced to a flame and the sound of a human voice talking. We all respond to that setting like children, wrapped with wonder and entranced by the possibility of a story. I thought that sounded like just such a beautiful way to start us off today, um, to come together around our computers, not quite a campfire, but to hear the stories of um, two incredible uh, people and leaders and um, athletes and their journeys. So I wanna welcome Richard Peter um, and I'll probably call him Bear throughout because that's his nickname. So just so everyone uh, knows who I'm talking about. And uh, Riza Izzard. And um, I've had the pleasure of working on and off with both of them for a few years in different roles. Um, Riza and I met through the work she was doing with the Aspen Institute in the US around project play and particularly around physical literacy development and how that can be such a catalyst for people's engagement in sport and physical activity throughout their lifespan. And Riza is just such a champion of social justice, gender equity, and um, is doing some really incredible work through her PhD that she's currently studying. So I look forward to you sharing about that, Riza. And um, Richard Peter is a Paralympian, multi-time Paralympian in para, um, in sorry wheelchair basketball, and then in uh, para badminton, which is a new sport to the Paralympic movement. And I had the pleasure last fall of actually watching Richard compete down in Lima at the Para Pan Am Games. And it was just such a gift to be able to see him there um, and participating that way. And he's also employed with the Praxis Institute, which is part of the Rick Hansen family of companies and work. So um, I look forward to hearing from both of you about more about your personal stories and how you're connecting this um, journey of belonging across your personal and professional pathways. So I'm going to flip it. Riza, you already are unmuted. So I'm going to flip it over to you to kick us off. Thanks so much, Andrea. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you who are here with us this afternoon or um, maybe late morning, depending on where you are calling in from. 
Um, I'm Risa Isard. I use she, her pronouns. I didn't know that it's pronoun, pronoun international pronoun day. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I am on the land of the Nakachan, I'm not sure that I said that um, correctly, and Piscataway peoples, um, uh, otherwise known to those of us as Washington, D.C. in the United States. Um, professionally, as Andrea said, I'm a sports policy expert and industry vet. Um, I've had a career in sports, working in college sports, pro sports, um, in sports policy. Um, and uh, I traded that in, if you will, uh, to pursue a PhD in sport management. Um, so right now I'm a first year doctoral student at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and I'm studying sport management really with a focus on advancing equity in and through sport. And so I'll talk probably a lot about sport and about equity. Um, but, uh, you know, like for me, these things go hand in hand. I think about equity in sport because we know that there's inequity in sport and we need to, we need to change it. Um, I also talk about equity through sport because um, I actually think that fixing equity in sport, like it matters, but it really only matters insofar as we're using sport as a vehicle to promote social change out of sport, to have much greater impact than what is happening between the lines of a court. Um, and so on the one hand, I think that what I do, like I just said, like really does tell you a lot about who I am. Um, it's been my passion since I was 13. It's been informed by all, all kinds of experiences before then and since then. Um, but also I was talking with Andrew before and I don't really think that's what this podcast is about is like, what do I do for work? Um, and so other things that are important to me are, or who make me who I am. I grew up in Arizona. I'm a runner, an advocate, a feminist. Um, I'm queer slash not straight which for me is just as much about the people, the gender of the people I date as it is about kind of my own experience um, with not really feeling so attracted to so many people. And so I don't use the label asexual, but those are experiences that resonate. Um, I'm active in the Jewish community. I like musicals. Uh, my family is, in support, is important to me, but I'm an adult child of divorce. So family is complicated. Um, and just like kind of in the interest of stretching myself and things I don't really normally talk about, but if you're not going to talk about it on Bridges of Belonging, where you're going to talk about it, I think like mental health is super important. Um, so if you see me fidgeting over here a little bit, um, I've got some kind of muscle Tourette's type tics and um, ADHD and things that that make life really interesting and challenging and beautiful and a lot of things that I'm still kind of figuring out. So um, that's me, what I, you know, what I do professionally and, and why that is important to me. And then um, all the other things I do outside of those hours. Wow, that was quite the way to kick us off. Thank you. I love that introduction. Um, full of just so much who you are and the energy you bring to everything you do. So thank you for that uh, robust and just really authentic introduction. Um, Richard, you get to follow that up. <laughs> yes, wow. I'll do the more of the relaxed version, I guess. Yes. <laughs> um, so for a few of you that don't know me, my uh, name's Richard Peter, um, originally from the Coast Salish tribe here in uh, Canada, uh, Vancouver Island, BC. Um, I guess for a bit about me uh, and that I got injured, uh, I'm a Paralympic athlete, I got injured as a young child. And so I grew up with my disability all my life, um, but that um, really didn't change much in regards towards uh, mainly my family and they've really pushed me to stay involved in sport. And so that's what I've always done. I'm a sport for life kind of a guy. Um, and I think that's what I try to do now too, that I try to help promote um, anybody, with, whether you have a disability or not, to get out there and be active and, and enjoy as much sports as possible. And, and of course, uh, not that you have to reach for the, you know, reach for that gold medal, reach for the stars, but just to get out there and enjoy. Um, that's what I try to promote. I, I never really talk about my Paralympic uh, background. I just say, no, I enjoy sports um, in any kind of um, means, I guess, whether it be basketball, uh, badminton, hand cycling, tennis, you know, just any kind of activity. I would just say, oh, well, let's get out there and get out there and have a good time. And maybe it's great that that's where I live here in Vancouver, BC, that uh, I've got a lot of opportunities for those different, different sport outlets. And so I try to get out there and enjoy it as much as possible. And, and I think that's what I try to promote when I do talk to somebody who's either newly injured or newly introduced into parasports is to um, enjoy it first. And then, and then if you do have more further aspirations of, of making the Paralympic team or going higher and higher and just say, all right, well, that's when you can start the focus, but first off is just to enjoy it and I guess so that's what I always try to promote. <laughs> 
Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Also a fantastic introduction. And uh, I know there's uh, so many pieces within that that we can start to weave through as we go through this conversation today. So thank you for that. Um, Richard, I'm going to stay on you. So you said earlier, um, you stay involved in life through sport. So tell us maybe a little bit about sort of your journey of belonging or times where you didn't belong and sort of what that looked and felt like for you as you navigated your life. Actually, one really good story is um, I actually had a chat with when I first got involved, involved into Parasport. I chatted with the executive director of uh, BC Wilshire Sports and uh, we sat down and she sort of mainly asked me the same questions that are what are your sort of what are your goals or what do you want to achieve outside of sport and and a few things that we did she did write down I was surprised that she wrote wrote the five things down and said all right what do you want to focus on and and then she showed me I think 20 years later and said oh here you did sort of achieve a lot of that stuff and so that was pretty wild and mainly for me, because I've gotten a lot of assistance into me, you know, ended up where I am here today, um, that I always try to give back. Um, so, you know, coming back from a First Nations background, it was, you know, we've always had a love of sports on many different levels. And so um, that's always been a part of my life. Um, and then sport, that's always been, you know, hand in hand there. That's uh, where I've always grown up and that's what our family's always done. Um, and then once I got involved into Parasport, that just sort of, again, um, combined, um, whether it be um, the para world, uh, disabled community and getting involved into sport again. So that opened many more doors for me. And so that's, um, we of course didn't have any financial funds as my family to, you know, get some of these sports chairs and equipment that which do um, get pretty expensive. And so I've always had a lot of assistance um, in finding chairs and finding equipment, traveling to different events. And so there's always been um, loads of support that I've had from my community, my family, from the para sport world. And so it's always been, um, you know, I've always been very thankful for that. And that's where I sort of complete that circle that I'm always there trying to help, you know, any new athlete or anybody else that's getting involved or just newly injured. Uh, you know, from working at the rehab center here in Vancouver, um, that I meet a lot of newly injured uh, clients that are coming through there. So I'll just try to, you know, say, all right, yes, this is a very traumatic inju injury that you've just encountered, but, you know, life still can go on. And whether, you know, you enjoy it with sport or just getting back into life, getting back into school. And so I always just try to, I guess I'll say complete that circle and try to bring it back and say, yes, today is a very tough day, but you know, it gets brighter and, and gets a bit easier. And I think for me, that's, um, I've been very thankful that I could still continue on and play sports um, and just enjoy it as much as I can. So I think um, that sort of really combines a bit of my, my First Nations background in, involved in sports. And then um, in the para world, that's really continued on and helped me open so many more doors. And so it's um, got me to where I am today. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing those stories of belonging. And particularly, uh, I loved the example of um, the executive director at BC Wheelchair Sports sitting down and working with you on like, what are those goals? And then bringing them forward all those years later and sharing them back to demonstrate how far you'd come and what you'd accomplish. So that's an awesome story. Um, Risa, over to you. I want to hear a little bit more about your belonging journey. Let's focus on the belonging for now because uh, that's where Richard landed with his and uh, what that's looked like in your journey. Yeah, I think it's a great question and I was reflecting on it earlier today and um, you know, I, I do think, right, like for as many times as I felt like I don't really belong, um, I've been really lucky to find spaces where I do really belong and they're, um, they're so powerful to be in in those types of communities with those people. Um, a lot of times I've had to create them for myself, like create the community that I want and need and invite others into them with me. Um, and that is so fulfilling. It's also like utterly exhausting. Um, other times I've been really lucky to find community sometimes in really unsuspecting places. Um, and when I take a step back and I think about like, what made that a place where I found community. Sometimes, you know, I, I go and I look for community. I look for belonging somewhere because I think, oh, I'm definitely going to find it. I remember, you know, 
um, in undergrad, I like went to the Hillel because I really wanted Jewish community and it was like really not my place, right? And I found community in places on campus I never would have dreamed would have become my places. And I think I've had experiences like that as I've moved from different cities things I thought I was going to want and find and need, I didn't find, but I found something else. And when I take a step back and I look at like, well, what did these things actually offer me? It's interesting because they, you know, at the, at like the granular level, they were offering the same thing, the things I needed. It just showed up in a different package. Um, so just, you know, one, one story of one particular place that I found belonging more recently, um, that I kind of stumbled into a community that was so special. And so um, thanks to the Schusterman Foundation, which is a, a foundation based here in the U.S. And, and does a lot of work in Israel as well. Um, I spent 10 days in Israel on a trip with sport industry leaders. And um, I don't like even know how to convey just how special that time was. We were such a diverse group, like by gender, by race, by religion, by age, by disability, by nationality, like so much diversity. And yet like such a powerful community. And I I think a lot about the the last night of the trip when some of us stayed up throughout the entire night um, in just this beautiful space and um, watching the stars and then watching the sun come up on the other side of it. And um, in that in the course of that night, we had really hard conversations about hard stuff, about racism, about sexism and sexual harassment and assault and about prejudice and injustice. And people were sharing their real stories. And at least personally, I can say like, I don't have a lot of positive experiences of talking about sexism in mixed gendered settings. Like those tend to be in my experience rather frustrating. I don't feel heard or seen. Um, I, I tend to leave feeling pretty invalidated, but like this crew on this night, like people listened intensely and they honored people's truths and they asked questions from a place of wanting to understand, right? Like not wanting to adjudicate, are you really telling me what happened? But like, I wanna understand more about what this was like for you. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that when others shared, when people of color spoke about their experiences with racism and when others shared about their experiences with prejudice and other ways that they felt the same. And I kind of think that people did that just like this, um, this ability to speak your truth um, and to hear it as for others to witness it, hear it as true, be validated um, and supported in that moment was was so special. And that was like the pinnacle of these 10 days of this community that um, for all of its diversity, um, I think sometimes we can think about like well, to belong, we need to be with other people who are just like us. And um, and for all the diversity that this group brought, there was like so much community and belonging. Um, so, yeah. Mm, I love it when those sort of stories kind of surface for you and you're able to like point to that. How, how many years ago was that? Um, it was about two years ago. Okay. Yeah. And it's like still so clear for you that that was just like such a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, these, like these people are making me feel seen, heard, understood, and appreciated for living my truth. Mm -hmm. That's just such a rich opportunity. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, Richard, let's go back to you and talk about a time when you didn't belong. Like you've talked about how sport's been a place for you and um, your journey through sport and how it connected to your First Nations um, like family and that sport was so important in the First Nations community. What about times when you didn't belong, when those different areas didn't align for you or you didn't have the support you needed? Share a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> but um, yes, that's, um, I think that's one of the benefits or, or it's one of the starting points that when I got injured, I got injured at uh, five years old. Um, so I grew up in a small town. I was the first kid that had a disability. So I had to go through all the schools had to be um, adapted and made accessible. And this is uh, late seventies, early eighties. So this was definitely um, a big challenge for a lot of uh, different communities. And so, you know, I owe a lot of it to my mom too, that she always fought for me to you know, get back into public school and, and continue on. And then same thing with sports. And she's mainly, you know, as any, as a, any kid back then, you know, the parents just sort of kicked you out the door and said, all right, go play, go have fun. And so that's always been a bit of the challenge in that um, I think I've been very fortunate with all the friends and, and family that I've had that uh, let's say sports for sure that, all right, 
I, I'm not going to go out and play soccer, <laughs> but we'll go out and play baseball or football. And, and so we'll find a sport that's a bit easier for me to participate. Um, so let's say in baseball, I'll be the pitcher um, or on the first base. Um, football, of course, I'll be the quarterback just so that I don't have to run around or wheel around as much. Um, same thing with ball hockey. We played a lot of ball hockey. And, and so I, at first they said, all right, Richard, you're going to be goalie because I had, was sitting in a wheelchair. And so I took up a lot of space in the net. Um, but as the guys got stronger and were harder, had harder shots, I said, I'm no longer goalie. <laughs> but so there's always been a lot of different challenges in that. Um, I'll even say one of the biggest things that did really a big moment for me was, gee, I don't even recall how old I was. Let's say I was about nine or 10 years old, um, wheeling through the mall in, in my hometown. And I saw a younger kid that was walking with, with their mother. Um, and the little kid must've been three or four, five years old. And it's like, oh, mommy, look at that person in a wheelchair. And like, oh, what's, you know, why, why is he in that? What's going on? And, and the mother, the parent sort of, sort of shushed her, her child and said, no, don't, don't look or don't talk about that or, probably felt a bit embarrassed. And I think that really helped me in that I was like, well, no, you shouldn't shush any, any child because a children a child wants to learn. Um, and so that really instilled it into me that if anybody does have a question for me that I'm open to answer any questions about my disability, about my chair, about what's going on. And so that was one big thing, probably, you know, why it helped for me that I was able to do you know, go out and do a lot of these talks, go to schools, go to different organizations and, and just share my story. And, and that's one of the big things that I've always, you know, helped. I want to get out there and help share my story and say, this is what happened, but this really hasn't changed what's gone on for me. And so a lot of those things have really shaped me into what I've, I've you know, what I do now. Um, it's always tough to say with Balon and that, you know, whether you always definitely have a lot of different issues being the only kid in a chair that that's always a big challenge and you know with any kid that's going through school you know there's always going to be bullying or you know there's always going to be a few different issues if you see something different then you're gonna pick on that and so that's where i you know was always very i guess very strong or very uh, at times said right well this is this is why what i'm doing and and this is the reason that I'm in it. And, but then also that helped me put that little chip on my shoulder that said, all right, well, Richard, you can't do this. And I'm like, yes, I can. I can make this happen. And, and so that's always been very good, good for me too, that it's continued to push me on whether when anybody does say, no, you can't do this. Um, at first, yes, you definitely feel uncomfortable and, and have that self-doubt and say, well, maybe I can't. But then I'm like, no. I should be given the option. I should be given the opportunity to get out there and give it a try. And so that's why I always try to tell anybody new that says, all right, I can't do this. And I'm like, eh, there's still a way around it that yes, you might have a new injury, um, whether it's a broken back, broken arm, anything, broken some legs, less function. I was like, well, no, there's still an opportunity to get out there. And if you really enjoyed it, you still can get out there and you know, ride a horse, uh, play some hockey, play wheelchair basketball, you know, get back to work, get back to school. Uh, there's still a way that's, you know, that it can be done. And, and it's good to find stories of other people that have still have continued on to, you know, become a dentist, you know, become an accountant and, and get out there and do a lot of different things. So, so that's always good to share a lot of those stories. And yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah. No, that was great. I, um, I particularly love the story about how the kids, um, your friends that you were growing up with figured out ways to make sure that you were able to play with them and it, those opportunities kind of emerged through the different sports that you were trying and trying different positions in the sports. Um, it reminds me of that uh, jumpstart ad that we have of the kids on the, the wheelchair basketball one where the kids are out playing basketball and then they all figure out a wheeling apparatus of some sort so that uh, the new kid on the block can come and join and play with them. It's uh, I think kids are so incredibly creative and I loved as well that you connected it back to like creating the openness for people to ask you the questions um, and particularly kids to kind of explore that and understand because, you know, I think about sort of the raft of 
topics that are floating in our world right now. And like, if we allow kids to be, to question and to ask those things early, what difference would that make in terms of how they embrace the differences and the diversity and the beauty that exists in our world as they go forward, rather than sort of shutting it down and keeping it quiet. And then we create these, you know, um, isms or <laughs> is, if you will, in terms of how they grow up because they don't understand and they haven't had an opportunity to ask and explore those topics. So thank you for that. That was super rich. Um, Riza, I'm going to flip it over to you. Same question. Tell us about a time when you didn't belong and sort of what that looked and felt like and how you navigated that. Yeah, no, I think it's such a, a rich question. Um, and and I, I echo Richard, right? Almost like a, how much time do you have? Like, um, you know, like as a queer feminist Jewish woman growing up in Arizona, like studying at Duke, working in professional baseball in Fresno, California, like it's it's a uh, you know I'm certainly not in the uh, in the majority almost anywhere that I go um, or that I've worked or where I've you know really spent a lot of time and um, I, I think like that can you know there are lots of times right therefore that I've really felt like I didn't belong and I was thinking like maybe that's true for everyone uh, maybe that's like what growing up is um, and I also think as I think Richard spoke to like it can have a really profound impact and I know that for me it had a really profound impact being bullied and left out intentionally or unintentionally, just like not fitting in. Um, and, uh, and and so like you talk about not fitting in, let alone like, you know, belonging, which is this like even kind of higher order, right? Idea of fitting in. And so when I think about these times, I think both about sometimes like very big spaces where I just like don't feel like I belong, um, which I'll, I'll share a story, but I sometimes it's also in like these small spaces. Like I was reflecting on this experience sometime in the last year, I think some of my closest friends and I went to um, an NWSL women's pro soccer game here in DC. And I'm with my best friends. And at the same time, like the space of a women's pro soccer space as a queer woman means something so much different to me than it does to like all my straight friends. And it, it was this like weird thing of being like, I'm with my best friends, but I actually feel very alone because I think we're having very different experiences despite our relationship and despite the fact that we're in the exact same space and that you love women's sports too, right? Or you're excited to see whoever was playing. Um, and so I, I think I think it's like, you know, belonging, I think is kind of about like feeling like you're seen and feeling like the experiences you're having connect with like with the experiences others are having too. And so um, I think a lot about just kind of this like comical moment from undergrad when I was interviewing, I was a finalist for this like feminist fellowship kind of, um, and I, I was just like so elated because I was like, I need other feminists. Like I am so alone. And all I wanted was to be part of this community. So I was in this interview um, and they asked me, I think kind of this question, like what's a time that you haven't really felt like you belong or you fit in or something like that. And I remember like chuckling and thinking to myself and then just saying like every, I don't know if I can curse on this podcast, but like every damn day on this campus, like I don't belong here. Like where are the people who care about social justice? Where are the people who like aren't just trying to hook up and get trashed every weekend? Like where are the people who are really driven and like are here to learn not just what your teachers have to tell you, but like how to really impact the world or just like do something. Um, and you know, it, Ultimately, like I found my way and I'm so grateful for every opportunity I had in under, at Duke and like the spaces I did find and the people and the resources and the support. Um, and to some extent, even that struggle, because I think like having to figure out how to be who you are in a space that is like not really yours um, is so, so hard. And I think it builds a lot of strength that builds a lot of kind of confidence and determination because you have to be strong and like knowing who you are and standing for that. Um, and, and so it was transformative, all of it in the end, but like before it got to that point, I, I just felt so alone. And I think again, right, it was amplified by this expectation that like college was supposed to be the best four years of your life and you meet your best friends. And like, sure, by the end of college, I had incredible friends, right? But I think this these like times that are, expectations or our experiences don't match up with others or what we've heard or what we've been told and like where do I fit in this is this place for me can be um really really hard and so um I think I experienced that in in sometimes these like big spaces right like where do I fit on this massive college campus and this culture and at other times like I'm with my five best friends and I still somehow don't actually fit into the equation of this thing that we're doing together tonight 
Ooh, oh, wow. I love that answer. Oh my gosh. And it struck me that, you know, the effort and energy we put in trying to find those spaces and places of belonging is such so the opposite of how we should be living our lives, right? So like we've built the systems wrong if we have to work that hard to find the place where we should be. And it made me reflect on a stat actually, Fanny and I were looking at some of our slides yesterday and I have a stat that I pulled and I won't remember the author right at this moment, so forgive me, but 45% of straight white men are covering in their workplaces. So they're trying to fit in and show up in the ways that they think they're expected to. So if the system was built by straight white men and they don't feel like they fit in or belong, what does that say about the rest of us who have different aspects of our identity? It's like, we have built the system completely wrong. It needs to be torn down. Let's burn it down. Let's start over. <laughs> so I know you have a response to that. So go for it. <laughs> no, I just... I mean, I love it. I, I hadn't heard that stat and, um, and, and, you know, it's not surprising to me because I do think so many of us cover for so many things. Right. And so, um, it's easy to see someone's lack of diversity perhaps on the outside and, um, and that matters for sure. Um, uh, like who we are on the outside has such a profound impact on how we walk through this world. Right. And at the same time, that's not the only thing that influences how we walk through this world. Um, so I just, um, yeah, I love that. I mean, I don't love it, but I, no, I, I, don't. <laughs> I appreciate the perspective. Yeah, no, for sure. But it's like, how do we, you know, in this, in this year, in the like absolute mon, like <laughs> onslaught monsoon of things that have been coming at us and things that we're recognizing that need to be different as we go forward. Like, is this the opportunity? How are we going to grasp that opportunity? How do we shift how we're doing things to create those new ways forward that are totally different and they're actually built around what we all need to be successful? So Richard, I'm going to flip it back over to you on that note. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about sort of um, how you've taken your learnings of not belonging and the times that you have belonged and translated them into the pathway that you've been on. I mean, you talked a little bit earlier about sort of sharing in schools and kind of paying it forward. What has that meant in terms of both your career path um, as in work, your path as an athlete, your path or personally as well? Share a little bit with us. I'd say, I guess it's always, you know, you accept that challenge. Um, that's what I've always sort of worked with, whether it be a road barrier or, you know, a little speed bump. Um, there's always a few challenges that are there and, and it's, it's your choice. Like when I first got involved in basketball, um, so I was this new young kid that came from the island and it's got some pretty good raw talent and let's bring him out to basketball and, and athletics and try a few different activities. And then, yeah, I got a bit of a backlash because yeah, people didn't know who I was. And, and then of course, being the only First Nations kid too, that I got a, a bit of racism. And, and so actually that really struck me. Um, I went back home and, you know, I actually did, I nearly did end my career early on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Richard has a little bit of construction going on in the background, so it's a bit loud at the moment. So we'll just give him a pause to get through the loudness on his background noise. Is it better now? Yep, yeah, it comes okay. and goes. Okay. Um, yeah, so to talk about again with the uh, racism, I think I guess he doesn't want me to say the word. Yeah, there you <laughs> but, go. Um, um, so yeah, I nearly did end my career early on. And I actually, I owe a lot of it to my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather, I went back and shared a lot of stories with him. Okay, um, let us know when it lets up. But uh, yeah, no, I'd love to hear that story about your grandfather and sort of how he, uh, how you navigated that with him. So we'll maybe, oh, okay. No, maybe not. Okay, let's set, let's maybe flip Teresa and give you a little bit of a reprieve and then we'll come back to finishing the grandfather story. <laughs> um, 
Um, so Riza, same sort of question. Um, you know, you've had a pretty interesting career in some of the paths you've navigated and some of, I'm, I call you a bit of an innovator because you've been on the cusp of a number of things that were sort of new concepts in the sport space. Um, and now you're working on this really incredible sounding PhD. So maybe tell us a little bit about sort of your professional journeys and your personal journeys and how those connect to your learnings from belonging and not belonging. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, so I have to imagine um, that, you know, me caring about advancing equity in and through sport and in this world, like, doesn't come from a vacuum, right? It, it comes because I know that's what I need. I know that's what other people like me need. I know it's what people who are very different from me need. And so um, I think a lot about, um, like, I feel very lucky that these these times of belonging or not feeling like I belong can be so, so hard, right? In, in whatever area of life it is, if it's coming out, if it's navigating a college campus, if it's moving to a new city, um, if it's dealing with stuff with my family, like these things that feel very lonely and that are new and that are, you know, make me kind of not fit what I, what I think or what others think or whatever can be so hard. And at the same time, um, I've found, I've been very lucky that like I come out on the other side of those. And I know that when I do, I have a real opportunity to make it just a little bit easier for the people who are walking that same path right now, just a day after me, a year after me, five years after me, whatever. And um, I think that's like, it's not something I came to easily. It's something that I think as I, you know, went through my own trials and tribulations and then came out on the other side and shared about them um, that people would say like, you know, in that moment, people come up to me and, and confide and it, it illuminated for me actually how powerful it is to be able to, sh to share this. And I, I think of it as a little bit of that Spider-Man quote, like with, uh, with, I don't what great response with opportunity comes responsibility. Is that what it is? Something like that. And so, you know, I think about like, not everyone coming out is one of the hardest things I've done in my whole life. And I did it with the support of family once I was willing to like share what I was going through. And not everyone gets to do that, but I did. Right. And so I came out and on the other side, like I had family who loved me. And so if I'm not, if I, as someone who has family who loves me, I'm not going to lose financial support. I'm not going to lose my house. I'm not going to lose any of these things. If I can then say, okay, well, I have a little bit of stability so I can use my voice to make it just a little bit easier for other people who may be in the same situation. They're going to come in on the other side and their family's going to be there with them. And they're going to come out on the other side and they're gonna have lost people along the way, right? But like, if I can kind of, I guess it's like owning a privilege of a sort, right? Even in these experiences that are unprivileged, if I can say I have some privilege in here and how can I find that little bit of privilege I have to make it a little bit easier for others who are navigating these same waters, um, it's like the only way I know how to do it, I guess. It's super hard. It feels really scary every time. And inevitably it's also very rewarding when whatever it is, in, you know, someone shares a close friend or someone who comments on a, you know, a freelance piece that I wrote or someone writes on Facebook or whatever, like thinks that was helpful. Um, and so I think that's the least that we can do is all say like, where have I had to struggle and where do I have a little bit of privilege or a lot of privilege and how do I put those together to make the world a little bit better for the people who are coming after me? Um, and of course, also not just for people who are struggling with the same things we're struggling with, right? Um, I have a responsibility to make the world a better place for people of color, right? Um, and for trans folks, because I'm cis and right for all of these um, other things. So it's not just about like the exact journey I've walked, but but sometimes it is. And it, I think it is always then about like, where do we have the privilege to be able to use our voice to open conversations and make the world better? Mm, thank you. That feels like such a gift for you to share that and to um, have explored that and for the roles and voice you're using to help move our world towards a better place for everyone. So thank you. Richard, how are we doing with the noise factor over there? <laughs> Not good? <laughs> It's continuous, so I, I really never notice much. <laughs> okay, we'll just keep going. It's not yeah. that distracting for us. So if you're okay with it, just roll with it. Sure, sounds good. Okay, we'd love to hear um, about the rest of your story. Um, yes, yes, it was um, 
yeah, when I first got involved in sports. Um, so yeah, I nearly retired before I even got started. And I just got very lucky that I went back and, and just with a lot of those different emotions um, that, that did come up uh, as Riza talked about that, you know, whether it's mainly just acceptance that you go to, you go to different circles and try to find where you're going to get accepted. And I thought I'd found it with, with Paris sports. And then, then I got a bit of the backlash there. So I went and talked to, you know, had a chat with my grandfather and you know, get back. And I think he noticed that something was bothering me. And it's like, oh, what's bothering you today? And it's like, oh, I just went on this trip and, and had a bit of racism and really bothered me. And I said, really, I think I'm going to quit this. It's not for me. It's really bothersome. And, and then he really did sit down and said, well, you know, I support whatever decision you do make. Um, but then he said, well, do you enjoy playing sports? I was like, yeah, I love playing sports. And then that's one of the biggest things that he said to me then as well. It, it's sort of, do you want them to take that away from you? And that was one of the biggest things that, like I said, kept me going. Um, it really made me think and say, well, yes, I, I much more enjoy that sport than having yeah somebody take that away from me. And, and so that's really kept me going too. And, and that's, you know, like I said, I was full circle. I'll try to talk to somebody and say, you know, yes, if you still do really enjoy it or love it, then continue on. Um, yes, there's always going to be a lot of, you know, an uphill battle, whether a lot of roadblocks, you know, I've always had a few different things that were sent in front of me that were very difficult. Um, you know, my wife, Marnie, she's always talked about it with a few of the challenges that I've had in life. And she's like, really, how did you survive? How did you succeed? And I was like, well, to me, it wasn't, you know, yes, there's always a bit of a challenge, but it was just life. I was like, you know, I think I always do talk about with me getting injured as a young child it actually I always say it's it's your glasses your different my disability glasses you sort of you see things through a different lens um whether you know everybody is different uh, you always do want to try to get into a circle that you fit into but everybody's always got slight differences and for me it's I was able to see all a lot of those differences that are out there but then also how people see you too and so that's where I'll say, well, hold on here. This is, this is who I am. And I've always done that, you know, all, you know, all throughout my life and said, all right, here, this is what I enjoy doing. And, and I'll notice what other people enjoy also. And I said, well, here, let's do this together. And, and for me, I always adapted a lot of those sports. I said, all right, well, yeah, all right. I can't play baseball the same way you guys do, but here, this is how I can participate. And so I've always accepted that challenge myself. And I said, this is how I can participate in this event. And um, so it's always been problem solving um, all throughout my life that you always see little challenges. And, you know, if there's a door that's way too heavy, I said, oh, well, this is one way that I'll figure, you know, the easiest way around that. Maybe just time it that somebody walks in just before me, just zoom in right behind them. <laughs> but there's always little ways to try to find uh, that quick fix. And so I think it's always, like I said, that you always see things through differently through the lens of, of uh, I guess, being the kid in the chair, because everybody will see the wheelchair first, but then that's where I said, well, hold on, no, see me first. And that's where I'll always spark up that conversation and, and say hi, or, or just there, just so that it relaxes everybody and, and humor. I think that's also being First Nations and with my family, as, as Marnie found out when she first started to meet my family with how crazy they are, um, that they, you know, always sort of calmed that situation too and and that always sort of made things a bit easier and so I guess maybe that's where I've noticed it too and what I try to do also and just with Brennan and humor and and just sort of relaxing everybody and that's you know one of the biggest things that yeah maybe it's a little more relaxing and easier to bring up some of those tough conversations and tough topics and and so yes this is how hard it is but you know if there's the will there's the way yeah mm. I love that. Um, yeah, and I mean, humor can humor and play. I think are both such good um, good ways to navigate and bring people together, kind of in ways that they're not really anticipating, right? But it kind of breaks down some of those barriers and just lets people relax and opens them up to um, exploring with each other what that could mean and what that relationship can be about. Um, I then 
talk now a little bit about sort of that belonging and self journey and you both have referenced it as we've gone through the conversation in different ways but you know what was that journey individually around kind of getting to self-acceptance and self-love in order to really um, bring that to your relationships and feelings of belonging so maybe i'll let Teresa kick us off on that yeah. So first, I want to. Um, I just really want to elevate one of the things that Richard just said, which was this idea. And Richard, you should correct me if I'm misrepresenting it, but I think one of the things you said was that, as someone who goes through this world with a very visible disability, and you know what it's like to experience prejudice on that and on the basis of your race and your First Nation status, that like you see injustice in other places. Like it's given you lenses, if you will, right, to see how the world works in ways that others might not see. And, and it sounds like maybe not even just related to race and disability, but related to other things too. Um, and that resonates so deeply with me because I think a lot about like how much being a woman and being a religious minority and being queer like shapes how I, just like the way that I understand institutionalized oppression and systemic oppression, right? It doesn't mean that I know what it's like to be a person of color because absolutely categorically I do not right and I do understand systems of oppression differently because of and I think I see them a little bit differently um because of the ways that they work in my life right and um I have so much learning to do about specific ways that injustice operates on different axes and at the same time I think I have a bit of an easier time saying well sure of course like systemic injustice is a thing and systemic oppression is a thing right because I can see it um, and I don't know like what the answer to that is because it, it's not great for people to have to like experience injustice in any form to be able to like recognize injustice exists in other forms also. Um, so I don't know how to solve for that other than to say, Richard, I think you're right that these experiences that we have do shape how we see the whole world, not just our world. Um, and so Andrea, I think to go back to your question of like, how, can you reiterate it was like, how do, does our self love what yeah. that journey been like was that I just was so excited about what Richard said and I wanted to amplify it um because I thought it was so so key yeah no I love that so I'm gonna actually let Richard if I just wanted to know if Richard if you want to respond to that at all then let's take the time to do that because I do think it's a really crucial point in the discussion like I was saying well it, it's very true that everybody has your views and and I guess mainly it's, it's your your safe zone um, everybody's safe there and then that's the challenge of now making that circle bigger and bigger and and it's always I think for me I've been able to notice mainly other people's emotions and just how they interact with me and everybody has that like everybody whether you're in your your zone your safe spot but then you will always be judged I mean whether that is how we grow up or whether that's the education system you know it's hard to say as Riza mentioned, all right, how do you fix that? Well, it's it's not a one-step fix. It's, <laughs> it's it, you know, hopefully it'll be fixed in the next generation, um, somewhere farther down the road, who knows? Um, but everybody does encounter a lot of those challenges. And and that's what I always say, you know, with with life, if you think about down, you know, if you're driving that, you know, you're you're going down and you're gonna come to a, a T-section or a four-way stop. And, and then that's what I always say, whatever barrier that comes up, you have that choice whether to go left or right and and doesn't mean left or right is correct or, or incorrect but you will still learn um what direction you're going to go and that's your path um like i could say that you know i got very lucky that i ended this direction there could have been another direction that i would have ended up that i'd still be living back home you know maybe drinking got some little job that's you know and not be this athlete because I know I was definitely right on that road that I could have gone either direction. And, and so I'm very lucky that I had this choice. And there's always two choices, no matter what we have, whatever we encounter. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things that you learn from. I think that's sport has been great for me that I always say I try to learn every year, even right up to the last year I played that I was like, all right, I've got to try to improve myself or, or improve some aspect of my game and try to learn and continue to continue to grow and so do I know all the answers now I'd say no um but you know definitely hopefully help the next person of saying all right here all here's all the different options and this is what you can work on from here and, and that's one of the biggest things I'd say is 
you know, like I said, I've gotten a lot of support from my family to help me push me, you know, along those different directions and, and never really said, all right, it's better if you go this way, better if you go this way, but say, here's the different options. And this is, here's, you know, the direction you can go. And so if that helps. <laughs> Mm, I like that standing and kind of exploring those directions and what those paths taken and not taken all can lead to and the learnings along the way. Um, it makes me reflect sort of in terms of, and I think it ties to the question I started with, with Riza. So we'll maybe actually stay on you, Richard, to answer it. But, um, you know, what you described is uh, that exploration for yourself, but it also for me connected to like the empathy that's needed to explore our world and explore others um, realities and how we uh, understand and learn from each other so that we can create better ways forward. So I'll uh, leave that comment there, but then move to um, sort of your comments uh, that you were just going, the road you were just going down and sort of how that connects to sort of your own self-acceptance, self-love, self-worth to find those places of belonging. So we'll let you lead with that, Richard, and then we'll flip it back to Riza. I'd say even that's still pretty hard too, that you still you know, continue to look uh, to see if you're accepted. And, and so it's always you know, self-help. And you know, right now with COVID, that has probably given a lot of people time to sit back at home and, and think about, all right, now what's, what am I gonna do on my next path? I mean, Right now, I've just been sitting on the couch eating too many potato chips, so <laughs> I've got to work on that um, next path. My next path. Your self acceptance as to when you're ready, but but I guess same thing with it's your choices, and that it's mainly accepting your choice. It's it's all inner. Um, with sport, and even that's why I never. I never start with what I've done succeeded in basketball. I was like, well, that's not me. I don't always just say I'm a basketball player. I said, well, I'm Richard. I'm First Nations. I love all sports. And so I'll talk about all different activities. And so there's many different aspects and many different circles. I mean, for me, I've always had a challenge with I've lost um, or missed many different activities back home because I was off in sport. So then I was like, well, hold on. Why should I be doing sport? I should be back home with these family events. And then my family's like, well, no, Richard, you're fine. You're, it's okay to you know, do what you're doing and, and continue on your path. And, and so it's, it's always been a bit of a challenge of sometimes you, know, you step outside of one circle and then venture off into the other. And, but I've always had that challenge you know, continuously that to feel full acceptance or full belonging. And, and I enjoy both of them. And, and I think a lot of coaches and I've had support with players too, that I've said, all right, well, no, it's still your choice. Yeah, we'd love to have you here, but we know you've got a family event back home. And so it's been, you know, pretty open on both aspects. And I think that's, you know, I've been very fortunate that I've, you know, just come across that and, Everybody will always say, I'm sure if you talk to some of the coaches or some of the players that I've played with, that I've always been very quiet, sitting back in the background, but I'm always trying to take as much in as possible. And that's sort of waiting. And then I'll sort of speak up when I feel it's ready. And, and then I guess mainly once I feel I'm safe in that, when I, you know, I feel like I belong, then I can offer, uh, you know, my two cents. And so I think it's always been a bit of a challenge for me um, on, every different aspect. I think it's, I'd say, do I feel 100% belonging in all different aspects, whether it be work, my marriage, sport? I was like, well, no, I always say there's still room for improvement. And so I'm still trying to learn. Um, so I think that's one of the big things too, is continue to learn to grow those relationships, whether it be on all different aspects. And, and so, yeah, it's, um, but it's always, I guess, what I feel inside. <laughs> What's uh, hopefully that you, you feel that belonging with yourself and, and accept yourself and then continue on. Yeah, definitely a journey, right? And all the different facets of our lives and where belonging shows up and where you need to kind of navigate through what that looks and feels like. I love that you brought safety into it though. That's such an important part of a belonging journey is like being able to find those places where you feel safe and then that, how that influences your uh, feeling of belonging. So Riz, I'm going to flip that same question to you. 
Round two. <laughs> so I think, um, like Richard said, right, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing journey and I can sit here and confidently talk about coming out and also know, you know, that metaphorically speaking, there are any number of other things in life that I'm in the closet for. Right. Um, and I think that, that, that's, I, I assume, uh, that that's just actually what life is and will always be, um, is this continual process and journey. Um, but, but I also think it like, it's only that if we want it to be, or it's only that if we like, devote ourselves to it because it's it's also really easy to just well let me say it's not actually easy at all to be in the closet for anything but in some ways it can be easier than trying to figure out how to reach self-acceptance and come out and share it right and so doing that's a really intentional effort I think um I do think time helps and like little baby steps and things like that um maybe just one day you're like yeah I'm, I'm ready for this but but I do think it's like a it's a practice it's an intention it's a a way that you know we strive to live our lives if that's important to us then it's something that we have to work on and i think there are a lot of ways to work on it um taking like i think there's you know great work that you can do in therapy there's great work that you can do journaling with yourself there's great work that you can do with a best friend or uh, you know, my girlfriend is like my number one confidant and the things that I share with her, like maybe one day I'll feel comfortable sharing with other people too. But right now they live in that space and, you know, just like even within that is growth. Right. And so um, I think it's a, an intentional decision that if we want to find belonging, then we have to intentionally decide that. And we do have to devote ourselves to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that we do totally alone. We can enlist support and resources. Um, we can read books. We can, you know, watch TED Talks maybe, or like use online forums to connect with other people and, and these kinds of things. Um, but it, um, but it, but it is a journey and it's, it's something that I do think we have to be intentional about. It doesn't happen really just on accident, at least not most of the time. Mm, great sentiments to get us towards the end of our time together. This hour always flies by. So I'm going to give you, Riza, one minute to do a quick wrap up. And then I'll flip it over to Richard for the same thing. And then we'll uh, tie it all up in a bow. <laughs> um, I just think, I mean, this has been such a terrific conversation. And, um, you know, I think it's a really worthy conversation. I think both figuring out how we can make spaces for ourselves to feel like we belong is really important. And then also really, really thinking about how do we make spaces that other people can feel safe in and how do we build community in that way? And um, intentionally, how do we do that in our everyday lives with our close friends or our colleagues or our family members? Um, so I, I think it's a two way street, right? It's work that we have to do personally for ourselves and hopefully others will support us in that. And then it's work that we have to do to create a safer, better, more belonging world for others um, and support them in their journeys. And hopefully um, if we can do both of those, you know, sides of the coin, we'll, um, we'll have a really great quarter at the end of it. I don't know how to finish that metaphor, but, um, but, but I, I think it, it's, a, you know, this bi-directional process and it's really important and it's really worthy. I think it's, um, you know, I don't, I can't imagine that someone who's gone through a process of like, self-affirmation or discovery has really regretted it on the other side, right? That doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that are lost on the other side, but um, even on the other side, I think even with sometimes the things that you lose when you do it, you gain more. So it's a net positive. Yeah, I, uh, I posted a quote yesterday, we rise by lifting each other. And so when you were just using, um, talking about sort of the working on yourself and uh, working to support others, that just resonated for me as well. So I just wanted to share that. Um, thank you so much, Riza. Over to Richard. And just to help Riza out a bit there too, was uh, Spider-Man's quote was, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> power, power, not opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as a Marvel fan. Um, but yeah, so for me, yeah, just to reiterate there, what Reza was just talking about too is, you know, I always say it's, it's just enjoyment and fun. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I always try to leave everybody with and, and just it, the relaxation of, you know, whether it's, you know, for me personally, let's say I've been in the wheelchair sports world, I've been in uh, the peer world that I've helped, you know, newly injured clients come through and, and then also now the research world. And so that's been 
um, three different areas that I've always tried to uh, to work on and try to learn more about. And and so I would always say I'm never in one specific circle, but I've always tried to improve myself and try to learn more. And and I guess for me, I always just try to tie, you know, whoever I just meet, I say, all right, here, let's find your circles. And then, all right, let's try to make it as easy a transition and just say, right, well, if this is still something that you really enjoy, <clears throat> then try to get out there and continue on. And, and you know, again, just belonging <laughs> in that, yeah, that you can hopefully belong. And, and um, right now I'm, I'm sure I belong in a quieter spot, but <laughs> that's uh, something that you learn to grow with. And, and, and yeah, like sometimes I don't even hear it. <laughs> Well, there you go. Finishing us off with some humor. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I just want to thank both Richard and Riza. Riza had to run because she had a meeting uh, and a hard stop right at uh, noon Pacific. But um, thank you both so much for showing up and being vulnerable and sharing this journey with us. Um, such a beautiful conversation and uh, so many great takeaways for the audience. So really, really grateful to each of you for being here today. And uh, as I say, kind of at the end of most of these, I'm just so grateful for the network I have and the people I can reach out to who are willing to share these amazing stories. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to share our upcoming session. So um, on November 10th at 11 a.m. Pacific, we have Anka Jess, who is the founder of She's for Sports and Gail Hamamoto, who's the executive director of BC Wheelchair Sport, who we talked about earlier in the session, as well as the vice president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee. So super excited to uh, share that session. And um, thank you again for being here today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>